So our speaker for today is Anne Marshall, and she has 11 years of experience as an academic librarian and was most recently the subject liaison to the political science department at the University of Rochester. Um, she has provided computer training and support to upstate rural public libraries as a part of the Gates Foundation, uh, a Gates Foundation grant. She is co-author of What an Experience, Library Staff Participation in Ethnographic Research, and is a former chair of LPSS. Go, go LPSS. Um, so, Anne, thank you very much for joining us today. And I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Linda. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you all for being here today. So there are um, a couple of resources available associated with this uh, presentation today. Uh, first, the slides, um, and also um, a resource list. And I've, I've breaking, broken down this presentation into four parts. Um, and then if time allows, there's some more resources at the end of the presentation. So the place we're going to start are, is with some interactive tools, a, uh, some maps, uh, which seems very uh, apropos for environmental resources. Um, and in this first section, you know, my kind of my thinking is, well, you know, hey, I've got an undergraduate who yeah, wants to do a project and doesn't know where to start. Um, so that's kind of my pitch for this first part. And then for the second part, um, I'm really going to focus on um, the data sets, how can I uh, identify and download some environmental data sets. Uh, thirdly, uh, I'm going to take a look at uh, a couple examples uh, from the uh, scholarly literature. Personally, that's the way I tend to find data most of the time, is to look at who's published on the topic and find the data that way. Uh, and then finally, uh, I have some resources um, that are more about kind of things that are going on on campus um, and some curriculum ideas. So um, the interactive tools. So uh, the one that I spent the most time uh, with was the EnviroMapper, which uh, comes from this EnviroFacts data warehouse. Um, and to get started with this, it's uh, brilliantly simple. You can just throw in um, a zip code uh, or other geographic information. And I did that, and I was given this very nice map. Um, the zip code I chose, just to show you the sense of what you're looking at here, is um, uh, Mount Morris area, which is about 30, 40 minutes south of uh, Rochester, New York. I wanted to point out this base map link, which uh, gives you a whole variety of different views to consider. Uh, the way that I found was most useful to get into the, the, the information and to get a nice kind of visualization of it is to search EnviroFact and specifically to search by program. And if you do that, you'll get this nice uh, graphic at the left-hand side that lists the various programs. And you can see we've already got some very basic kind of statistical information here. Um, this is telling us that in this mapped area, um, there are 140 sites um, that are connected with hazardous waste, 16 sites or toxic releases, and so on and so forth. Then the next thing I tried in here was to add data. So you can go to Add Supplementary Layers, um, and you've got a variety of options, places, transportation, water features, and so on. I went ahead and added school. And then I also took a look at the water features. I found that if I added water bodies and streams, I would get a bit overwhelmed. So I chose um, impaired waterways. And so now you can see we've got graphic pools and, and also for the impaired waterways. So what I did next, let me go back, is as you can see, uh, we've got all of these blue eyes in circles for really every single indicator on this map. 
And so if uh, you click on those, you're going to get a lot more information. I did that for impaired water bodies. So just let us know that uh, impaired water bodies are those that have excess pollutants and are not clean enough to support rec recreational use. So then the next thing I did is I went back to this uh, left-hand program data, and I chose just one of them, uh, the hazardous waste site. Those were added, and you can see they're now indicated on the map in green. And if you hover over, you will, at least for some of them, for the ones with numbers, uh, one here that I chose, um, Kelly Motor. And so the idea here, uh, kind of from an undergraduate perspective, is to kind of think, well, you know, what kinds of questions might this be generating? And you know, why does the EPA collect? data from Kelly Motors. And here I have, <laughs> I just Googled them. And so maybe for an undergraduate, this may kind of provoke some ideas. Uh, then I also went into the eye for hazardous waste. I thought this was useful in that, uh, you know, now we can kind of get connected to the policy dimension of this issue. And uh, it's helpful to think about why the EPA is collecting the data that it is collecting. And so this is telling us that this particular information that is collected has been done so under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Specifically, that legislation or that regulation uh, requires uh, data be collected in connection with those that generate, transport, treat, store, and dispose of hazardous waste. On that previous page, there was a link uh, where you could go look up um, by facility, and that, that works. I personally found this website to be a little bit more uh, intuitive and that there was more information. So. Uh, here we can search again by zip code, so I went ahead and did that. Um, you can see we get the same, we get uh, visual information, and here at the right-hand side, we're now getting information about the extent to which these various entities are in compliance or not in compliance with the regulations. Uh, in fact, you can see that we've got two facilities here with violations in the last three years. And if you scroll down, you can get much more detailed reports. So here, for example, we have uh, the Mount Morris Dairy Farm, which uh, had an issue with not being in compliance. And you can go into these reports and take a look at what the, uh, some of the issues potentially um, are. So I, I went back and searched by Kelly Motors. And you know, this certainly has this experience um, as well, where you may not get a lot of information, um, but you find, as it's listed here at the bottom of the screen, that there was no violation. So it looks like uh, Kelly Motors is, is doing or has done what the EPA has asked them to do. And so I throw in a slide here, uh, LII, which uh, many of you may know about, um, but just again to make that connection between the data and the legislation. And uh, the reminder that when you encounter things that, you know, what the heck does this mean, um, that a resource like this can be very, very useful to put, um, put the data in context. This next tool, uh, EPA My Environment, uh, works in a similar way. Um, you can put in a location. And as an example for this one, um, I searched this time by county. Uh, this is a co little comparative analysis I did. I searched um, by Monroe County, which is where, uh, where we are in Rochester, New York. And then I, I for comparison, I, uh, I searched by Los Angeles County. And you can see uh, just visually here with the green and the yellow that, that we've got some differences between the two locations. Uh, I've just blown up some of the, the data here so that it's a little bit um, easier to read. Uh, so Los Angeles County has uh, over 2,000 toxic releases. In Monroe County, we've got about 188. 
Uh, you can see the big differences between the ozone levels, um, between the particulates, about uh, three times as much. It's possible to just very quickly do some kind of um, interesting comparisons by location. Um, they also have a My Health uh, tool here. Um, and so again, I did a comparison between Monroe County and Los Angeles County. I thought was, what was interesting, I, um, I thought it was interesting that in Monroe County, even though with all those differentials, we actually had a, a double the, the level of benzene as compared to Los Angeles County. So that was, um, I thought that was kind of interesting. And then I threw in this uh, slide from the census uh, because you know, it, it kind of been, again, providing context to undergraduates. It's, it's not, uh, it's likely that the, one of the reasons for these big differences is, is check it out, the population density, not surprisingly, um, is much, much higher in Los Angeles County. Um, so it may be that in Los Angeles County, their, their ecological footprint is much smaller than ours in Monroe County. That would, that would take a bit more research to, to figure out. The other uh, screen I wanted to, or resource I wanted to point out was that the EPA has a number of apps for smartphones on their site. Here is a portal to 290 apps about the environment. So there's lots of stuff to experiment with here. That is the end of that first section. So actually getting into the data. In the EnviroMapper tool, there is a download uh, option. What was going on? And we had a question there. about My Health Tool. See, does My Health Tool allow you to collect health data in the EnviroMapper section? You know, the first thing I uh, wanted to show you is just to take a look at some of the reports that are posted. And so they have one that they recommended right up front here. Uh, you know, and I'm trying to kind of do some comparable um, data sets to what we looked at from the map. So uh, here uh, we're given both Excel files at the top, and then we're also given um, PDF at the bottom of the page. I took a look at the one focused on where you live. Just a quick tip I wanted to point out uh, for these Excel files, it, it turned out when you open this up, the default page is the notes page. Now, at first I was like, is this all there is? <laughs> but if if you go down to the, uh, you know, just a, it's an Excel thing, you know, but I've got a bunch of other tables in here that you get to uh, by the options at the bottom of the Excel um, that was important in this instance um, to take a look at. The next thing that I looked at, which I think is, is useful for this particular example, but we'll see it's useful for other examples as well, is um, that the EPA does let you create your own customized data set. Um, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with like the IMF and, um, you know, World Bank tools. Um, maybe not quite as, uh, sophisticated and, and, and powerful as those tools, but there's a still a ton of data in here that you can compile into your own customized table. So this first one is, uh, FRS, uh, data. And that is focused on facilities. So uh, like we were looking at uh, for the hazardous waste site. For step one, the first thing that they uh, ask you to do here is to um, look through and you have to choose between one of these types of information. Um, you can see we've got things organized by SIC codes, um, zip codes, program coordinates. Um, I tried a couple of these. Uh, I personally found the one at the top to just seem like it, it had a, a bunch of variables in it, so I tried that one. So after choosing your your option, uh, which of the tables you want to look at, then it, it comes up and gives you all of your, your variables. I thought this, uh, this indicator at the top for not 
that you can see in red. <laughs> do not do not select the column located directly above. If you select this column, I I think what they're they're telling us here is this is just querying. Uh, uh, it looks like maybe an access database. So if we want the count feature, we we shouldn't also select this other feature. And so I just I what I did here was search some kind of basic location and uh, facility information. And then if you scroll down, uh, you can see there's a number of other variables as well. Um, I'll just draw your attention to ones here at the bottom. Um, because they seem the most kind of meaty in terms of um, being in a substantive variable. Um, there's one here about the ozone. I chose one about uh, particulate matters, you know, how much stuff is in the air. Um, they tell you here it comes from the air green book. And so now we're on to step three. So I've, I chose my uh, kind of my general area, um, broad category that I wanted, and I chose my specific um, variable. And now I'm able to narrow it down. Um, at first, um, I chose here, you can see I just chose uh, New York, and then I chose to output to CSV file. However, when I did that, uh, I went above their maximum result list of 100,000 rows. So then I had to go back. Um, so I just to keep it simple, I narrowed it down to zip code. Um, I got a very uh, manageable table when I did that. Um, and you can see that for this particular um, set of locations, I didn't actually have data uh, for this PM25 2006 area name. So it looks to me like that means we didn't have. Um, you know, this, this was not a location where there was that particular um, issue. Okay, so, you know, having gone through those three steps, it looks to me like though that kind of customized search is available for a variety of different types of data that the EPA offers. Under the air category, we could do a customized search for greenhouse gas data. Um, same for water discharge permits, toxins, and also um, radiation. Um, it is a kind of option and process that seems at least somewhat similar across these different types of data. Um, also, if you scroll down from this, uh, this introductory information, you get uh, an annotation about this, the data itself, and what you'll find in that section. Another thing that uh, seems potentially useful from the EPA's website was the data finder. Um, you know, I should also mention here that there are options to search across. You can see here the search box. Kind of the scenario I was considering was. Let's say I don't know what I'm looking for. <laughs> uh, and so one could certainly search um, if you've got a particular specific topic or, or collection of types of things that you're interested in finding. Um, I will say that, you know, as I start to play around with some of these links in here, it looks like some of the links may be, anyways, the one I tried, it looks like either it was a glitch or some, a couple of the links may need updating. Um, anyways, that was my experience. So the next way I tried to get into some of this data was uh, data.gov. Some of you may be, may be uh, quite familiar with this. Um, I believe this website uh, went live in 2009 and, and then got a new interface in 2010. So it's still somewhat new and it's really uh, grown exponentially in terms of the number of data sets that are here. Uh, the one that I experimented with was ecosystems and you can see they recommend some data sets uh, to take a look at. Um, uh, the one I tried was the biodiversity resource hub 
And again, we're taken to a map. Again, it makes sense. You know, we're looking at environmental data. Um, we're given a map as a way to get into, into the data. There's a lot one could spend time with here. Um, I'm, I just gave you a, a URL to a PowerPoint that I thought did a nice, seemed to do a nice kind of overview of how to navigate um, through this particular site. Um, they also tell you in that PowerPoint uh, much of the data for that project you can find from this source. They recommend, you can see there's 14,000 data sets here. So that's another uh, resource to know about. So then I came back to data.gov and I said, okay, let's take a look at, at energy. It will also then take you to a variety of options, including data. And there are 413 data sets that you can get to through the Department of Energy's data catalog. Okay, let's um, let's jump into searching the scholarly literature. Uh, like I said earlier, this is the way that I typically look for data. So I'll give you a couple examples about how I've gone about that. Um, so I just, you know, here's a search from an EBSCO database doing um, academic search premier here. You know, I think even faculty and graduate students don't often search like this. You know, as librarians, we're able to do these sophisticated searches, which can, um, can lead us to some excellent data resources. Um, I threw in the state uh, keyword there because I was trying to think about, well, how can we come up with some comparative data across states. So um, here's one that I, that looks good to me, scaling uh, CO2 emissions in U.S. urban areas. And of course, if we just flip through the pages of the article until we get to the message section, they tell us here right in the first sentence um, where their data set comes from. It come, pro, comes from this thing called Project Vulcan. And of course, if we just Google Project Vulcan, up, uh, Vulcan, up comes the data set. And I thought well, it was kind of interesting here to see uh, that this is a project that is hosted on Arizona State University's website. But in, in some respects, it's, it's, it's government data in that it's, well, it's not created by government entities, but it's funded. Um, by both, in this example, by both NASA and, and DOE. So that's one example. Uh, I also did a Google Scholar example. I actually searched in this one for the, the name of the agency. One of my little tricks I like to use is to actually search for the term table. Um, I figure, you know, if, if I pull up an article that's got uh, you know, 20 tab tables in it, or the or a table is mentioned in the text of the article. Maybe I'm a bit more likely to get some really nice data-rich articles. I picked out uh, one about greenhouse gas emissions, and for this one, I, I just went straight to the bibliography. There's uh, the energy outlook, annual energy outlook. Um, how available? So that data is online. Um, if we Google for it, um, the two, 2015 report is available, uh, both in PDF and Excel. Uh, and if we look around a little bit more, we can see um, that they also have um, a PDF um, archive. A couple of tips about remembering we can we can get a lot of this information uh, just researching uh, scholarly articles. And next, I wanted to show you some resources focused on college and university campuses um, as a way of thinking about um, you know what's happening on our own campus, where as librarians uh, might we do outreach. Um, or target our services around government information and data, and then also, you know, what's happening on other campuses, and how might we make connections to build upon um, you know, our own programming and offering. The first resource, some of you may be familiar with this, 
is that uh, the Princeton Review has um, a guide to green colleges. They have, this is just one example, nice write-up um, about each institution listed within the guide. And also has just some, um, you know, information that are in, is in all of the Princeton guides. And then they add in some information, statistical information that is uh, specifically on environmental issues on campus. So this is, there's a lot of really nice, rich information um, in this guide. You know, another way kind of into this topic is to um, actually, you know, look at what the NSF is funding and an entire environmental sustainability program within the NSF. You know, of course, this is useful for us to know about for our, our faculty and also a, a you know way to figure out um, what projects are going on uh, now that is both you know using available data um, and also will be generating uh, new data. Um, I also just pulled up a couple examples um, related to specific things that are going on on various campuses. So this is a, an example of a of a of a syllabus, and I, I thought this one was particularly um, useful in that it's a, a, a class, as you can see, focused on research and focused on environmental research. And this, this particular course is for upper level majors, and they, you know, they give a nice description of kind of what they're expecting uh, their undergraduates to do in, um, in a semester long course. And then this other, this next slide, I really enjoyed looking at this guide, um, how you can see through this guide that there's uh, a connection between the assignments and then uh, between the resources that we put together uh, around the class. So I thought this was just another nice uh, example for thinking about, you know, how to make a connection between uh, the curriculum between what we do as librarians and all of the research. And that is uh, the end of the formal presentation. So um, are there any other questions at this point? An international resource that has been, has been recommended and is, is quite impressive is this the World Resources Institute. Um, what I liked about their offerings is, again, they have a very rich collection of data visualization tools that are then also paired with, with data sets. This is just an example of one of them where you can visually see coral reefs that are considered um, at threat. I can just very quickly show you how that works. You can see that they've coded different areas by color. And then here you can see in this uh, visual um, at the right-hand side of the screen, um, that when you've got the blue, the senior colors, that's considered at low risk. But then as you move up to the more intensely red or, or black colors, that's considered at most risk. And so um, the area that I chose to look at was south of Florida. Uh, you get a very nice visual here to get a sense of what some of the issues might be. And then you can go back in and you have data in various format that you can then, you know, use in, in Google Earth and other, other applications. You know, when one thinks about environmental issues, uh, China comes to mind. I thought uh, this this site was also rich and useful in terms of its offering. It is just one example. And I thought what was interesting about this is that you, you see the same kind of issue about trying to get a sense of, uh, you know, what, collecting the data, what is the potential oversight with here, you know, what they call supervision records. Um, even in a very politically different environment than in the U.S. I thought that that was uh, a useful uh, comparison. And here's just, uh, this link is on your, your list of resources that gives some background about this, 
this particular data set. Here's an example from the European Environment Agency. They have a number of data sets. The one that I looked at was nitrates in rivers. Uh, the question earlier in the presentation was about more regional data, and actually in this, for this data, that's exactly what they've done here. They've given signs of broader uh, categories to the data, and as in terms of looking at the specific zip code. Again, there's a data set that goes along with the map. Uh, you know, one can keep going and going <laughs> with the, um, these uh, resources. Um, some others that I thought were particularly interesting intellectually, but also to make uh, a really clear connection to, you know, everyday life, um, is the soil survey. There are, I believe, yes, there are uh, interactive features of this, so I, I haven't done it here, but you can see at the bottom of the screen, there's four basic steps you can go to. This, many of you are probably familiar with the National Conference of State Legislatures. I just wanted to point out that this also is an excellent place to go to see the environmental status of various legislation across the country on a state-by-state -state level. So I've just shown you here 2013 efficient building legislation as just one example. A number of resources focused on uh, water, uh, unsurprisingly. So here's uh, here's the website uh, about uh, watershed. Uh, the USGS. What's so great about this uh, site is that you can get real time data, flood data, drought data. There's lots of things one can do there. We have that's the end of the slide. Are there questions?